Good morning, everybody. To those here in the auditorium, as well as to those on our Zoom platform, we welcome you all for our regularly scheduled Sunday morning Bible study. As we always do, let's take our prayer to our Heavenly Father before we dig into his holy word. Let us pray. Our most gracious and heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, it's at this time we come before you, Heavenly Father, thanking you for giving us the wherewithal, Heavenly Father, to know that whenever we can get into your word, we should take that opportunity, Heavenly Father. Please bless everyone at the hearing of my voice, Heavenly Father. And as we dig into Nehemiah, may we truly get something out that we can learn from the Old Testament to apply to our daily lives as your modern day God's people. It is in your son Jesus' name we do pray and ask it all. Amen. We're in Nehemiah chapter 8. We're going to pick up at around verse 8, and then we're going to read to, through verse 11, our first section. I'll give you all a few minutes to get there. Here it says in Nehemiah 8, verse 8, so they read in the book in the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. And Nehemiah, which is the Tershasha, and Ezra, the priest, the scribe, and the Levites that taught the people, said unto the people, This day is holy unto the Lord your God. Mourn not, nor weep, for all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink the sweet, and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our Lord. Neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites stilled all the people, saying, Hold your peace, for the day is holy. Neither be ye grieved. Now let's take a look at this. They brought the reading unto the people of God, right? The law of God. And they read it and the people understood. But it says they wept and they were grieved. Who can tell me what's good about that? Why would they be grieved, Brother Charles? Why would they be grieved? Reading the law, right? Maybe it's consistent what they felt about themselves. You're on the right track. When they were in the midst of the reading of the law, it showed how they violated God's laws. Remember, they didn't keep a lot of the Sabbath. There were a lot of violations that they did. And it grieved them. So what's good about that? It shows that they had the right kind of heart. Didn't it? Because for us even to be saved when we're unsaved, we have to see what the word of God says. And it says for all of sin. So we have to realize, oh, I'm a guilty distance from God. That should lead us to want to repent, as Brother Charles said. Now, but then there's a flip side to this. It says, so the Levites stilled all the people. Who were the Levites? What did they, who were they technically? Sister LeCount, the priests. So the Levites stilled all the people saying, hold your peace for the day is holy, neither be ye grieved. Why is there a transition now? Anybody wanna take a stab at that? This goes back to uh, probably one of the best examples in Nehemiah chapter one. Remember when Hekaleah brought to and one of the brothers of Nehemiah brought to him the trouble that the people were in and they, that were in captivity of the nation of Israel? Did Nehemiah just rush out and run to get the place built? Said he mourned certain days. He cried and he fasted. Then he prayed, asking God to, to, to allow him to do what he needed to do. And then God let him go. It lets you know there's a time and place for everything, even in, the, even in the house of the Lord. It lets us know they took time to grieve. They saw where they violated. Now it was time to get up and get something done. What had they completed already? Anybody? Charles, you on a roll. That's right, the gate and what was inside the gate as well, Charles, where they were living. So they had built up the structure and they had everything they need to worship. Now it was time to fill up them. It was time for them to be filled up and go about doing God's word. Can you all relate to that? 
sometimes it takes time to fill up. You know, we use God's word for Bible study, refuting false doctrine. But sometimes you may be a little low. You may need to be filled up and you use the same word of God for that. Never forget that. We, we, we are in a, the fishes of men lessons and they're great. And they're about bringing people to Christ. But then there comes a time when you need to just sit down sometime by yourself and pray and find those scriptures that lift you up and meditate on them. God, all of God's word is good for that. Just time and place for everything. Is that all right? You know, what can, what can be a negative byproduct of mourning and grieving all the time? Yes, it's the account. That's right. It can hold you down. Not that it's designed to do that, but it can do it if it lingers too long. You know, when you read the scripture, I use this example all the time. You know, if you read the scripture where it says, cast your care upon him for he cares for you. You know, when you do a deep dive in that in the Greek, it's letting us know that we were not designed to hold on to sin or grieving for a long time. Not just sin, but grieving as well. It's designed, it's like any emotion God has given us. It's a signal for you to look at something. And grieving is when you feel like you're grieving, it's, it's time for you to address it so that you can resolve it and move on. If not, it'll pull you down because in the church, the church is about doing work of God, is it not? And sometimes you can grieve so hard, it'll keep you from doing what God would have you to do. I'm sure many of us have had time to say on Wednesday night and you get some bad news and it's 6.30. You sit back, our oh, service is starting at Bible study starts at seven o'clock. I think I'm going to stay in tonight. Anybody relate to that? It rolls through everybody's life. But we always have to take the time to get that resolved so that we can stay faithful in God's work. Distractions come in many shape of, in many shape and forms. They're not always something big. It can be just something subtle. Does that make sense? Any questions, comments, or if I confuse anybody, let me know at this time. Just raise your hand. We all right? Okay, if you just came in, we're in Nehemiah 8, picking up at verse 12. And we're going to read that verse 12 in its entirety. Nehemiah 8, verse 12. And all the people went their own way to eat and to drink and to send portions and to make great mirth because they had understood the words that were declared unto them. I love just some of the verbiage in Nehemiah. They make it so clear. Everybody understood. You know, I've always be, been a, a natural teacher. I never understood somebody who didn't understand something that wouldn't ask the question. I know people say, well, they, they don't want to feel, uh, feel like people look at them saying, you don't know that? I've always, I, in my whole life, I've always said, if I don't know, I'm going to ask a question because I want to know it. You think I want to fail the test, Brother Dada? Just because I could ask the teacher? Now, apply that to the word of God. If you don't know the answer, that's why I love a lot of the yams. They'll call it a minute. I love it. We got a question. Let's go. Peter cracks me up because she'll say, this is my last question. And then we'll go 20 more. I got This is my last question. <laughs> Just the desire for the word. I love it. And I'll take as much time as I can to, to teach at least what I know. If I don't know, I'll say, give me some time to do some research. I'll refer them to somebody who I know knows. But that's what this whole journey is all about. It's not an individual race. It's how we help each other. Does that make sense? But these people understood. Verse, we're going to take verse 13 to verse 18 because we've got to hit a few things here. And on the second day were gathered together the chief of the fathers of all people, the priests and the Levites unto Ezra the scribe, even to understand the words of the law. Look at that desire. And they found written in the law which the Lord had commanded by Moses that the children of Israel should dwell in booths in the, in the feast of the seventh month. What is that talking about? And they that should publish and proclaim in all their cities and in Jerusalem saying, Go forth unto the mount and fetch olive branches and pine branches and myrtle branches 
and palm branches and branches of thick trees to make booze as it is written. So the people went forth and brought them and made themselves booze, everyone upon the roof of his house and in their courts and in the courts of the house of God and in the street of the water gate and in the street of the gate called Ephraim. And all the congregation of them that will come again out of the captivity made booths and sat under the booths. For since the days of Jeshua, the son of Nun, until the day had not the children of Israel done so, and there was very great gladness. And also day by day, from the first day unto the last day, he read in the book of the law of God, and they kept the feast seven days, and on the eighth day was a solemn assembly according unto the manner. You got to love Nehemiah. I know I've said this, but I'm going to say it again. He built up the outside. Now he's building up the inside. He was leading the people the way God would have him lead him. Let's talk about some of the stuff. That was a big reading. Talks about booze. B-O-O-T-H-S. What is that talking about? You know, we got toll booze in Florida, right? What is What, what are these booze talking about? This is where it's important to go back. This is a go back to the Hebrew word and see what it meant. And notice with these bulls, it said you had to have it was some palm branches, uh, myrtle branches, all. What was all that for? And while you're thinking about it, there were many years where the nation of Israel violated this. They didn't do as God. That's why they were weeping before. Now Nehemiah is saying, okay, forget the weeping. It's time to get to work. Let's make sure we're hearing the God's word now. And as they read it, the people got moved. Ooh, that's a, that's a lesson in itself, yeah. Ooh, as they read God's word, people got moving. But what was the purpose of these booths? You don't hear a lot about that, but it's in God's word. You know what the same Hebrew word for booze was, what it meant in the English? It meant tabernacle or sacred tent. Each house within the wall had to have this. And what did they use to cover the top of the booths? That's where the palm trees and myrtle branches came from. It was for them to, to do their daily rituals within that booth. And notice what was that? It was in there at the top of their house. How beautiful is that? You know, the nation of Israel, they had a, a lot of minor feasts, but they had at least seven major feasts that they had violated over many years. That's why God sent them into captivity. Can anybody, we're going to walk through each feast, but can anybody tell me what each feast, not individually, but as a whole, what did the feast ultimately point to? Anybody tell me that? We're going to show how each feast ultimately tied it was a forecasting of Jesus to Christ and something about him. That was the ultimate reason. Yes, the, the, the uh, Israelites of the Old Testament, they did these, but it was a forecasting of what Christ was going to do for us. It's so important to remember that. I love how in Isaiah 59, it says, I, the Lord, have declared the end from the beginning. That's the best scripture for foreshadowing of the Old Testament to the New. If you want, we won't read this entire chapter, but if you go to Leviticus 23, that lists all the major feasts. So if you want to put that in your notes and read it. Right now, we're going to talk about them, and then you can reference it, bless you, in Leviticus 23. One of the first ones that I'm sure you're all familiar with, what about the Feast of Passover? How would that point to Christ? Now, that should be the low-hanging fruit for this group. How would the feast of Passover point to Christ? I know Charles hands are going to go ahead, Charles. When they, when they, what happened was they would they would have to slaughter a lamb. Yeah, that's the history, but how does it point to Christ? Oh, I see, I see where you're going. Go ahead. I'm sorry for cutting you off. They said they slaughtered the lamb and then they put the blood on the throat. Now when Jesus died, he was supposed to be the man of God. Amen, brother. He hit it. And then in the actual, under the Jewish law, they had to slay a lamb without spot or blemish. Then you put it on your the top of your window and the two doorposts. And then when the death angel sent from God passed over, if you had that, 
the death angel would pass over you. In other words, you were saved. How does that apply today? Well, we're baptized. Part of what we do, according to Acts 22, 16, and 17, we come in contact with the blood of Christ. That's what washes away our sins. That way, when Christ comes back the second time for judgment, those that are Christians, in other words, we're covered by the blood of Christ, it's going to pass over us. In other words, we have nothing to worry about as long as we remain saved. Key word is remain. Not once saved, always saved. There's a reason why Christ's blood still flows. Because as Christians, we can fall from grace. As Christians, we can sin. And we still have to make it right. Does that make sense? So that's the real purpose of the Passover. That was the easy one. What about the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread? A lot of people struggle with that one. Feast of Unleavened Bread. That mean anything to anybody? What does leaven represent in New Testament scripture? Now, I know you guys got, come on now. I know y'all tired. I'm tired too. I got to go for another one, Charles. Sister Kathleen. Uh, Catherine, I'm sorry. That's right. In other, and it's from what small little three-letter word? Comes from sin. What didn't Christ have? He didn't have any sin. This points right to him. He's the unleavened bread in the human sense because he was the only person that walked on this earth without any sin. That's why he qualifies to be our high priest. Does that make sense? That's what that feast of unleavened bread ultimately pointed to. In the, the natural world, we use we use yeast to raise bread, to puff bread up, right? Nothing wrong with that. But spiritually speaking, sin that yeast represents sin, which puffs us up. We don't need that. That's why we look to Christ. Make sense? You guys are doing pretty good so far. This one is kind of the, the, uh, the, the, the meaning is in itself. Feast of first fruits. I'll let y'all think about that. Feast of first fruits. When we say first fruits, what are we talking about? Sometimes it's the best. It's just the, no matter what you have, it's the first taken from it. I often laugh and say, you know, we have a first fruits of our check if you're an employee, right? Before you see that check, we've gotten something off the top. The government. That's an example of first fruit. They're getting theirs before you do anything with it. They know if you get it, they may not get theirs. How does that apply scripturally? What's the feast of first fruits? Now, we saw it in the Old Testament. They would give the best of their crops and everything first. But how does that tie to Christ? Brother Slocum. That's right. That's exactly right. The only one that rose from the dead, that what? Never went back. Then we have other people that rose from the dead? Yeah, what about Lazarus? Did Lazarus rise from the dead and never died again? Yeah, he died. He died another physical death. But Christ was the only one that was risen of God that never went back to the grave. That makes sense? And the first fruits has a dual meaning. The other dual meaning is the first fruit, fruits that rose with him. We often talk about the day when Christ rose from the grave. Anybody else rise from the grave that day too? Some people get scared when I ask that question. It's in the Bible. Yeah, many of the saints rose from the grave as well. Can you imagine that? That would have been something to see. Let's say if you had, if you had a family member living during that time and they were saved through Christ, they may have been one of the ones that rose that day. That would have been something, wouldn't it? You're grieving, have a funeral, then they're at your door the next day. But it was a time frame in which that happened. A lot of people say that people can uh, raise people from the grave, I do things like that today. I've yet to see it or hear about it. They'll claim all these special gifts that you see in the Bible, but you don't see anybody raising anybody from the grave. Go to the grave. We'll get CBS News out there. Because it's not allowed today. God didn't authorize that. 
but that's the feast of first fruits. And that's one, two, three, four. Now we have number five, feast of weeks. What is the feast of weeks referring to? This is a time when they would bake the bread and it was unleavened bread, but then they would separate two loaves and put leaven in it. And then they put it together. What could that represent? You had two different types of loaves that were together. Sister LeCount. Oh, she said the Jews and the Gentiles. Let's prove it through scripture. You're right. Let's go to John 10, 16. I just love using this verse because it's so misquoted today. Go to John 10, 16 and think about what our dear sister just said. The Jews and the Gentiles. Before we read, I had somebody read this. They weren't in the church, but they said, this is why we have denominations today. I said, oh, no, you're sadly mistaken because something happened before that. Denominations are a byproduct of false doctrine. You think the Bible is going to promote false doctrine? This is what the two means, John 10, 16. And other sheep have I. What was the original sheep? Nation of Israel. God, see, Jesus is saying he's going to have another sheep too. And other sheep have I, which are not of this fold. That fold would be in the nation of Israel. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. One fold and one shepherd from two. The two were the Jews and the Gentiles. If you accepted the gospel of Christ, you became the church. We have Jew, Gentile, and church. Does that make sense? Any questions as far as we continue on with this? The other feast, many times it's called the Feast of Trumpets, but it's also called Rosh Hashanah. Feast of Trumpets or Rosh Hashanah. How does that get us to Christ? I'm going to ask you some leading questions to get you into it. I said Rosh Hashanah was also called what? Feast of what? Ooh, I just said it, y'all. Y'all listen to me? Feast of trumpets. When you think of trumpet as a Christian, should that make you think of Dizzy Gillespie? Miles Davis? Spiritually speaking, what should it make you think of? Charles? According to the Jews and Thessalonians, it talks about that when the trumpet sounds, the people that, not the people, Christians. That's exactly right, Brother Charles. The trumpet for Christians, remember in the Old Testament, the trumpet was called what? The shofar was a ram's horn, right? And they blew it when? Charles. Exactly, to alert them of, of any kind of trouble or something that they need to do, they would blow the ram's horn. For Christians, we have a trumpet as well. But who's going to blow it? See if anybody remembers. Who's going to blow the trumpet? It says, and who is it, Charles? Is an angel's going to blow it. That's right. Charles batting a thousand today. Angel's going to blow it. And it says, and the dead in Christ shall rise, and we which are alive shall be caught up in the air with them. And there shall we, there shall we ever be with the Lord. Shortly thereafter starts judgment. So that's why we have the feet of Rosh Hashanah or the feast or the, or the uh, trumpet of lights. That's why it ultimately points to Christ Jesus. Everything that happened in the Old Testament is a type of foreshadowing. Any questions so far? It's pretty easy to follow. It's always easier when you know. That's why we have to study. After that, we have, I've heard this word pronounced two ways. I've heard Yom Kippur and Yom Kippur. What does that mean? It actually stands for, when I tell you what it stands for, you should know, Day of Atonement. And it, it, it wasn't many days after the Feast of Lights either. What would be the ultimate Day of Atonement? Charles. Well, what's the ultimate Day of Atonement? We know an individual has Day of Atonement when they're baptized. 
But this is talking about the ultimate day of atonement. What is it? You still got it. It's, it's basically judgment day. That's exactly right. When Christ comes, and I've, I've heard Christians say, and I get this question, they'll say, wait a minute. If I'm saved and I've been working hard on my life, why would I be judged? Is the Christian judgment the same as a person that's unsaved? No. Not at all. The Bible says, the Bible does say, all knees shall bow and every tongue shall confess, right? That's not the same for everybody. If you're unsaved, it's going to be by default. You have no choice. You're going to realize, oh my God, what the Church of Christ said is true. You're going to have to confess, but the consequence won't be the same. The consequence is the lake of fire. And people will know that if they die before Christ comes in the Hadean world, they will already know that that's coming. But what about Christians? Christians don't go before judgment. We go before judgment for the purpose of rewards. Can we lose rewards for not doing what God said? Yes, but the person can be saved. Wouldn't you want to get everything that God has in store for you? I think about the analogy I love to use. And I saw an actual parent do this one time and it cracked me up. It was Christmas and she had a whole, whole lot of boxes, Brother Didell, uh, uh, papered up with the, with the Christmas wrapper and she had the kids' names on it. And the kids would go through, they'd pick out theirs, they'd pick out, pick out, pick out, pick, pick them out. And then she left a whole bunch in the corner. She said, y'all do those first. Open up, got some knives. That's back when, when uh, race car tracks were popular when I was growing up. And then she said, y'all can't have any of them. And they were the bigger boxes. He's like, why? He said, you, you, you don't qualify for them. I, I got you what you wanted over here. But they, they were still focused on the boxes that they couldn't get. And then I, I, and I remember when they, as they got older, I said, why did that bother you guys? Because all they said was they were the bigger boxes and they were was more boxes to get. <laughs> May we never, ever forget what God is blessed with. If God, has something, if God has something for you, you should want it. I understand the mentality where people say, I just want to make it in the head. And I get that. But God has things. You know what the Bible is? And you've all, you've all heard me memorize the scripture all the time. I have not seen nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man those things which God has prepared for them that love him. I don't know about you all, but I got a heavy imagination. And no matter how far I can take it, I haven't scratched the surface of what God has for me. That should make us win. You know, that's called the best incentive you can have. Imagine if your boss, you came in the next day and he said, if you have your reports done in the next 10 minutes, you can leave and go home and you get paid for the rest of the week. How long would it take you to get to the office? I'd leave my suitcase right there and run to the office to get it done so I could get home. Because that's a serious incentive. But look at what God has told us to do in his work. Could anything touch that? It's supposed to be absolutely amazing. And of course, we can't think God has revealed his word to us because we can't think on his level. The Bible lets us know that. So he's telling us just how great it's going to be in our own 3D way of thinking. Is that all right? If you weren't motivated to do the work of the Lord, you should be now. Any questions or comments before we do the last one? The last one you don't hear a lot about is called the Feast of Sukkot, S-U-K-K-O-T. Anybody tell me how that ties into Christianity or Jesus? The Feast of Sukkot. Ironically, when we go back to Nehemiah 8, we're going to hear more about that. Remember when they read from the law, the people were grieved and wept? And Sister LeCount did a great job showing us, and Brother Charles too, showing us how they saw where they had fallen short and violated the law of God for many, many years, and they felt bad about it. Now Nehemiah's giving them a chance to get it right. You know what Sukkot was all about? How you fall short how you fall short. So how can that lead, how can that uh, connect us with Christ? It's very simple. It's the very reason why we need Christ because we fall short. 
Isn't it safe to say as a Christian, a Christian life is a hard life when you compare it to making it in this world. But is it impossible? No. Why? Simply put, because the scripture says all things are possible through Christ Jesus. You want an interesting study? Get, get an exhaust, don't get any concordance, get an exhaustive concordance. You can get them online or if you buy it in the store, they're about that thick, but worth every penny. Make sure it says exhaustive concordance and look up just the two words through Christ. It's a lesson in and of itself. The whole thing is designed for us to do things through Christ. Person may say, well, how, how do you do that? That's why you have to read those scriptures. That's a separate lesson that I'll do later. But when you study just how you do it through Christ, it makes life a whole lot easier. Still challenging, but at least you have the tools. You may not be a carpenter, but if your door comes off the hinges and you got the hinges and you got the screws and you got a screw gun or a screwdriver and you got somebody like some kids to hold the door for you, <laughs> it's not hard to figure out to just line the holes up and turn the screws, but you need the tools and everything. That's what through Christ has provided for us. It gives us the tools that we can use to fight. Is it easy? No. Can we win? Yes. If we do it God's way. God never promised us anything that's going to help the flesh. He promises everything that can help our soul. And sometimes as a consequence, it can hurt the flesh. But is the flesh going to live forever? I don't see that anywhere in the Bible. The spirit is already covered. It'll go back to God. But we need to work on the inner man that has the soul so that we can live forever. I don't think there's a problem. If it is, y'all let me know today. Is there any problem that you think is going to worry you when you make it to heaven? Man, I wish I would have closed that last deal. Man, I wish I would have went ahead and went on to Disney World. Nothing's going to compare when we make it to heaven. That's why we have to have a focus like that right now. It's always easier when you practice, isn't it? Be it sports, be it if you have to study. I tell the kids in my classroom all the time, there's one little girl, Crystal. Every minute she gets, she's studying. That's why she gets straight A's, literally. And one kid, kid, one kid was like, man, that test was hard. I was like, why was it hard? All he says is it was hard. I said, how many times did we have a review? Three times. How many pre-tests did you have? I had three. How many times did I ask you if you had any questions? Every time I came to class. So you know what's missing? You. You didn't study and you didn't apply yourself. Crystal applies herself every time and asks questions. That's why she got an A. It's not hard. Because sometimes they'll make themselves seem like, well, I'm just dumb. No, you're not. You're lazy, but you're not dumb. Because you're not studying. May we not have that problem with God's word. May we, may we have a desire and a hunger. You know, God's word is also called as like our spiritual food, right? Daily bread. And the, the real example that I use every day when I talk about that is, imagine not eating for seven days. Now, you may be fasting, nothing wrong with that. But you can best believe when you come up that fast, you're hungry. If you're on the eighth day, you walk through that kitchen and you smell a T-bone steak off the grill, if you're meat eater like me, you see that T-bone steak? Ooh, brother Slocum, I said, baby, I give you a million dollars for that steak right now. Because that, that's how much it means to me, because I'm hungry. Well, what about if I don't feast on God's word for a week? Do I still have the same hunger? See, I'm supposed to. But if I don't, I haven't developed that appetite for it. You ever had foods that you probably didn't like, but you developed an appetite for it because you had to eat it? With many young kids, it's like vegetables. They don't want to eat them. Then as they get older, they realize you need vegetables. The earlier we realize we need God's word daily and the earlier we start eating, the more we'll hunger for it. And you know what, what excuse we don't have today? Today, if you got, I mean, cars, cars today got uh, Sirius FM. They got the, the satellite radios. You can get God's word all, almost any kind of way if you got some kind of device. Church of Christ is strong on Facebook. Church of Christ is strong online. You, you can hear sermons almost anywhere. 
I sit in my lunch break listening to Bible study. Just turn on my iPhone. We have no excuse for not getting studies in every day. It was, I ain't got to study every day. Well, do, do you want to be considered noble unto God? Consider this scripture. Go to Acts 17, 11. And then we'll get back in Nehemiah. Now, when I say study, that's not saying you got to have it. I say you got to do a full PhD thesis like our brother uh, Stephen. No, I just said a study. That's you interacting with God's word in some way. But look at what happened in Acts 17, 11. Notice the key words. It says, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica. And there was a group of people that's being compared, those in Thessalonica, and it's actually going to be those from Berea. God declared the ones from Berea to be more noble. Wouldn't you want to know why so you could do it too? Let's find out. It says, in that, they received the word with all readiness of mind. So when the word was taught, they wanted to hear about it. And search the scriptures. Somebody give me that last word. What does daily mean? It's almost hard to use it when you give a definition of a word, you know, using it in the same sentence, but it's almost hard not to this time. Daily means every day. <laughs> That's right. For what reason? Search the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. These were the, the Bereans were on fire for God's word. Shouldn't we be the same? Should we be any different? Did they have a, the internet? They have talking Bibles? Nothing, but yet they still did it. Matter of fact, they didn't have God's complete word. They had the Old Testament, but they used it. What do we have? Bible translated in all major known languages. That's why we don't need speaking in tongues anymore. Got the Bible on the internet. If you don't have a Bible, you can pull the Bible up on the internet. Look at it. You can have it read, talk to you. I'm amazed. Not only that, you can get lessons already done for you. You can get books of the Bible broken down for you. We're without excuse. Talk about the information age. May we remember that. Let us get back to Nehemiah. Chapter 9. Let me just watch my time here. Okay, we're getting close. Chapter 9, verse 1, it says, Now in the 20 and 4th day of the month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting and with sackcloth and earth upon them. What was the purpose of sackcloth? We saw it a lot in, in Jonah as well. Brother Charles, you're up. Sackcloth and ashes were a form of either mourning or repenting. That's exactly right. Verse 2, and the seed of Israel separated themselves from all strangers and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. Wow. That's powerful. Notice, didn't we see Nehemiah do this in Nehemiah chapter 1? And they're doing it. They're connecting back with their heritage. Do we see that a lot in, in the modern day? We should, though. There isn't a day when I stand in a pulpit, if I'm preaching, I don't think about my grandmother and all her uncles and all her brothers, my uncles, and how they were ministers, deacons, or elders, and how that, that made such a big impact on me that all her brothers chose to serve the Lord in leadership, first, first bell. May we always tie back to something. And maybe you weren't brought up in the church. Nothing wrong with that. There's something you can tie back on. Then you're the one setting the pace for your family. I want my two boys to know when I pass that they, they have a work to do. And I hope I provided some kind of motivation or inspiration for them to continue on. And do even greater work. That's what this whole thing is about. If you want to see a lineage, look at when I say Lois and Eunice, who is that? Beat them. I saw a hand go like this. I'm going to call you. <laughs> you remember Lois and Eunice? That's right. 
Timothy's mother and grandmother. So, you know, grandma started it. She made sure that, that, that her daughter knew it. And it was, and actually went on to who? To Timothy, who worked closely with Paul. So, you know, he was exposed to some real Christianity. Paul didn't play. That's natural succession for the church. Timothy became a natural leader because of how his mom, mother and grandmother brought him up and he aligned himself with Paul. And y'all know the story of, of Moses and Joshua, right? When Moses passed away, did they have a meeting to have to decide who was going to head up the nation of Israel? God put him right in place because he had been there all along. Many times in the Old Testament, you'll see Joshua referred to as Moses' servant. Because he was right there with them. A Moses minister sometimes in the, in the Hebrew word. Because he was right there with them. So it was natural that he would be the next one to step up and lead the nation of Israel. And did he not lead them? Because he had a great example. We'll take one more that we've got to close out. Verse 3. And they stood up in their place and read in the book of the law of the Lord, their God. One fourth part of the day and another fourth part that they confessed and worship the Lord their God. We're going to close there before we start verse 4. Notice the devotion to filling up. Ask yourself, when do you fill up? That's what we're supposed to do. They realized where they fell short. They got the place of worship together in the security. And now they're filling up so they can worship truly. Do we have a nice place to worship in? I think under anybody's standards, it's a wonderful place. Are we filling up? Now, we fill up on Sunday. We fill up Sunday evening. We fill up Wednesday. Now, we fill it up every day. It should carry over. It's not just those three times. It's what we do. I love how Paul said in uh, Romans 12 and 1, it's our reasonable service. Reasonable. In other words, it's what's expected because of what Christ did. Any closing questions or comments or anything that I need to make clear? Now, because you have to have it interpreted right. If they're just following the Old Testament law without studying the New Testament, they wouldn't know. These were foreshadowing for us. Remember when the Bible says for whatsoever uh, uh, written aforetime were written for what? For our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. That was to provide you hope in knowing that the person who was going to bring real salvation is coming. There was no salvation in the Old Testament. Can they hear me, T? There's no salvation in the Old Testament. So you had to get it in the New Testament, which leads to a question, well, what if I die? You're in the Hadean world. When Christ was crucified, he set the captives free. The blood covered you. So all you got to do is follow Christ's plan. He's already figured it out. But everything that we get in the Old Testament, for the most part, is just a foreshadowing of something greater. If we have a, if we have a, a New Testament, why would we need an Old Testament? Does that make sense? Gotcha. Any other questions in auditorium? If not, please bow with me in prayer. Our most gracious and heavenly Father, it's once again that we come before you, Heavenly Father, thanking you for all who took the time to tune in, both here in the auditorium as well as on Zoom, Heavenly Father. Bless us as we close this portion out, Heavenly Father, and break. And when we come back, Heavenly Father, please bless us to worship you the way you would have us to worship you. It is in your son Jesus' name we do pray and ask it all. Amen.